the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now, the Bible was not originally written in the English language, as shocking as that sounds. But it was written in the Hebrew language, and in the Hebrew language, the word for God in this first verse of the Bible looks something like this. If you were to spell it in English, it would look something like this, and it's pronounced Elohim. Let me hear you say Elohim. Elohim. In the beginning, Elohim created the heavens and the earth. Now, the word for create is the word bara. Let me hear you say bara. It's this forceful, energetic word of making things out of nothing. In the beginning, Elohim barad, the heavens and the earth. Now, the earth was formless and void. The Hebrew phrase is tohu vavohu, which gives me great pleasure to say. <laughs> Some translate it wild and waste. The spirit of God was hovering over the waters. This Elohim has some sort of spirit. And then God spoke and said, let there be light, and there was light. God saw that the light was good and separated the light from the dark. The light was called day, the dark was called night, and it was evening and morning the first day. So God speaks some sort of word and makes things. In verse 1, this God is some sort of creator. In verse 2, this God is some sort of spirit. And in verse 3, this God is some sort of word. This God is one, and yet God, this God is several. This is some, God is some sort of multiple person, some sort of community of creativity. What a strange way to begin a very, very long book. Now, uh... God says, let there be an expanse in the sky to separate the waters above from the waters below. And so God makes this expanse and calls it sky, and it separates the waters above from the waters below. And it was evening, and it was morning the second day. So in this poem, right away, there's this refrain, and it was evening and morning the first day, and it was evening and morning the second day. Well, we don't say it that way. We say morning, that evening. But in this poem, which is what it is, it's evening, then morning. We'll get to that in a couple hours. Now... <laughs> God said, let the waters be gathered to one place and let dry ground appear. These gathered waters, God called seas, and this dry ground, God called land. And it was evening and it was morning the third day. And then God said, let there be lights in the expanse of the sky to give light to the earth and to serve as signs to mark the days, the years, and the seasons. God made a greater light to govern the day, a lesser light to govern the night, and God also made stars, and God saw that it was good. And it was evening, and it was morning, the fourth day. And then God said that the waters fill with teeming creatures and let them reproduce according to their kinds. They'll figure out how. And then let the skies be filled with winged creatures, and then them, let them reproduce according to their kinds. And it was evening, and it was morning, the fifth day, birds and fish. And then God said, let there be animals, let there be livestock, let there be wild animals, let there be animals that crawl on their bellies, let there be small dogs whose owners dress them in sweaters at Christmas time. <laughs> And God said, it's a little bit weird, but nevertheless, <laughs> it's good. And then God said, let us make man and women in our image. And so God made people, and God saw that it was very good. And it was evening, and it was morning, the sixth day. And then God saw all that God had made, and God rested now, birds go in the sky, and fish go in water. Thank you. It's been great. <laughs> the sun, moon, and stars, well, they essentially go in space, serve it to give us light and dark. Animals and humans go on land and sea. The things in day four 
fill in day one, the things in day five correspond to day two, and the things in day six relate to day three. In fact, the, the dominant work in the first three days is God separates, and in the second three days, God fills what has previously been separated. So the days are all interconnected. Never mind the fact that the way that we measure an actual day is the movement of the sun, the moon, and the stars. And so the way that we move a day, the planets, doesn't come till day four, which raises the question, how do you know the first three days are actually days? What a fascinating poem. Now, if you begin to look just another layer deeper and ask, well, are there any patterns that might tell us what it's about. Well, this word bara is kind of the driving, it's the engine of the poem, God creates, God creates. The word bara occurs in three different points throughout the poem, and at the last time it occurs, it repeats three times. It sort of jumped out to the first hearer of this poem. And this God has a three in oneness. So there is a three figures dominantly in the poem, which raises the question, are there any other patterns that we should be looking for? Well, the first verse in the Bible has seven words. The second verse in the Hebrew language has 14 words, seven times two. The word earth occurs 21 times, seven times three. The seventh paragraph has 35 words, seven times five. The word God appears in this poem 35 times, seven times three. Five. And the phrase, it was so, occurs seven times. And the phrase, and God saw, occurs seven times. There are sevens and patterns of sevens all throughout the poem. It's arranged in patterns. Now, if there's lots of threes and there's lots of sevens, the question, of course, is, are there any tens? <laughs> if you have that kind of time on your hands. The phrase, to make occurs 10 times. The phrase, according to their kinds, occurs 10 times. The phrase, and God said, occurs 10 times, three times in relation to people, seven times in relation to other creatures. And the phrase, let there be, occurs 10 times. Three times for things in heavens, seven times for things on earth. You begin to think the writer had help. So the question remains, what's it about? If you've never read the Bible and you opened it up and you read this first poem, this opening stanza, and you were asked, what's it about? I assume, well, it starts with God, and it starts with God creating. There's all sorts of creating, but then it ends, and God rested. Now there's this rhythm, there's this cadence, there's this beat to the poem, evening, morning, and it was evening, morning, second day, evening, morning, third day. It, it has a certain groove to it, and yet this groove is glaringly absent. Day seven doesn't have a, and it was evening in the morning. Day seven is just, and then God rested. And, and the seventh day just kind of continues on. The rest have a definite ending. The seventh just lingers on and carries forward. I imagine if you were asked, well, what's it about? It must have something to do with God creating and God resting, and, and then it must have something to do with people in our role in the midst of this creation. It begins with God creating, but it, it ends very glaringly with God resting. And somewhere in the middle is this vast creation with humans right in the middle of it. And the universe is vast. It's massive. Scientists are generally agreed that our universe has somewhere around 100 billion galaxies. Somebody counted. And the general estimate is that each of those galaxies has somewhere around 100 billion suns. And they believe that each of those suns has at least 100 billion stars. And they're now estimating that our galaxy alone has at least 100 billion black holes, which is why some afternoons you feel slightly depressed. <laughs> now, when you get to the bigness of the universe, things get very strange very fast. There's a galaxy called the Andromeda Galaxy, which is racing through our universe at 200,000 miles an hour. Stars do unbelievably strange things. 
There are stars called neutron stars. They are essentially what's called hyperdense, which means their gravitational pull is so strong that these stars are literally turning in on themselves. When this gravitational pull becomes so strong that it pulls the star in on itself, then its weight, density, mass, and volume takes on all sorts of strange characteristics. Here's an example. A neutron star weighs has a friend named SpongeBob. <laughs> Unbelievable. The art police would make an arrest for that, just boom. Now, a neutron star weighs several hundred million tons. A neutron star weighs several hundred million tons and fits in a teaspoon. When you deal with the bigness of the universe, things get very strange very fast. Nothing is as strange as light, which comes from suns in the form of particles called photons. And photons travel at the speed of light. Now, yes, the speed of light is incidentally the speed of light. Now, at the speed of light, and the way that light travels in particles called photons, things get even weirder. Here's an example. Uh, let's say you're standing in the street and you see a car coming at you at 20 miles an hour. You elect not to step onto the curb this way or to step onto the curb this way, but you decide to turn and run as fast as you can away from the car that's coming at you at 20 miles an hour. We don't know why you do things like this. So you turn and you run as fast as you can away from the oncoming car because when you run, you feel his pleasure. Now, Let's say the car is coming at 20 miles an hour and you reach a top speed of 10 miles an hour. Now, when you were standing still, the car was coming at you at 20. If you reach 10 miles an hour and you look back, the car will now be bearing down on you at what speed? 10. Well done. Now, let's draw this just because I think oftentimes the drawings help. Here's you. And, and <laughs> interestingly enough, you've grown dreadlocks for the occasion. <laughs> now, uh, 10, 20 equals 10. And we all say this because we have what's called a Newtonian understanding of the universe. Isaac Newton, mechanical laws of physics. Uh, an object in motion stays in motion unless acted on by an outside. Flashbacks to ninth grade. We were taught that there are these rules that govern how the universe functions. Safe, predictable, plug in the numbers, and you'll get your answer. We were essentially taught what's called a cause and effect understanding of the universe. Certain things work on other things to produce and lead to certain results. Give me A, give me B, I'll give you C. The problem is light travels at 670 million miles an hour. If you're standing in the street and a particle of light comes at you <laughs> and you turn to run the other way, which raises a whole other set of questions. <laughs> if you're standing still, it comes at you at the speed of light. If you turn and run one mile an hour, 10 miles an hour, 100 miles an hour, a million miles an hour and look back, that particle of light will always be bearing down at you at the exact same speed, the speed of light. Well, a man named Albert Einstein got onto this in roughly 1915. He said, wait, 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 wait. The more he discovered about light, he said, hold on, light doesn't follow any of the rules of our Newtonian understanding of the universe. Einstein said, wait, wait, he essentially said the universe is not static. It, it, when it comes to light, there is no A plus B. Light just does its own thing. When, when you get to the bigness of the universe, the universe bends and it warps and it distorts, and it doesn't matter how fast you run away from light, it always will be pursuing you at the exact same speed. Well, as you can imagine, this is obviously his general theory of relativity, was an absolute revolution in the way people saw the universe, because it was assumed that the universe had these predictable, predetermined ways that it operates. 
but with light, it simply doesn't follow any of those. The universe and its bigness is just plain weird. They've even found in our galaxy a planet which is racing through our galaxy at 67,000 miles an hour. At the same time, it's racing through our galaxy at 67,000 miles an hour. It's also spinning, rotating at 1,000 miles an hour. This planet is called Earth, and this is why you should wear a seatbelt. <laughs> Now, the Earth has a sun, or, or maybe we should say our sun has us. The Earth receives 99% of its energy from the sun. The sun converts for us 4 million tons of energy every second, and over an 11-year sun cycle, that energy output varies less than one-tenth of one percent. All of this at a distance of 93 million miles. 92 million miles, no life on planet Earth. 94 million miles, no life on planet Earth. Now, the Earth is unusual from other planets in that the Earth tilts on its axis at 23.5 degrees. Other planets in the solar system? Earth. <laughs> Now, the question is, why does the Earth tilt? Well, if the Earth did not tilt, it would run the risk of becoming what's called tidally locked, which means one side of the Earth would get stuck facing the sun all the time while the other side would never see the sun. So the one side of the earth would get hotter and hotter and hotter until it could not sustain human life, while the other side would get colder and colder and colder until it could not sustain human life. So this 23.5 degree tilt of the earth's axis is just exactly precise to allow this little blue and green floating ball to sustain human life, which raises the question, why does it tilt? It tilts because 40% of a gravitational pull that comes from the sun pulls it over. The other 60% of that tilt comes from the gravitational pull of a little rock we've come to know as the moon. The moon and this pull is what allows planet Earth to sustain life. No moon, no life. Which raises the question, how did we get our moon? Scientists believe that our moon was some sort of meteor or asteroid that was just flying through our galaxy and essentially got stuck in the Earth's gravitational pull, making it the cosmological equivalent of, oh, all right. <laughs> But I have a dark side. Hydrogen on planet Earth must convert one seven thousandth of its mass to helium continually for the Earth to sustain human life. 0 .007, 0 .008, no life on planet Earth. 0 .006, no life on planet Earth. Our atmosphere is 21% oxygen. 23% oxygen, no life on planet Earth. 19% oxygen, no life on planet Earth. The ocean, our oceans are 3.4% salt. The oceans are 3.4% salt, which is the exact percentage of salt in the human bloodstream. 4% salt in the oceans or our bloodstream, no life on planet Earth. 2% salt in our bloodstream or the oceans, no life on planet Earth. This is, by the way, called the science of fine-tuning. And there are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of these unbelievably precise numbers that all add up to life on planet Earth. Earth, carbon levels, gravitational force, the density of particular minerals and, and primal elements that all add up perfectly. Metaphor is simply this. It's as if there are these dials to create and sustain life on planet Earth. It's as if there are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of these dials, and every single one of them has been adjusted just perfectly. And this one goes to 11. And And every single one of them adjusted just perfectly, hundreds of them. It isn't just that there are hundreds and hundreds of them, and somehow someone has adjusted them just perfectly. It's the haunting truth that if just one of them were even slightly turned 
in any direction, it would render the accuracy of all of the hundreds of others irrelevant. It isn't just that there are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of these dials. It's as if you just messed with one of them. It wouldn't matter about the precise accuracy of every single other one. What a strange, mysterious little floating blue and green ball we call home. Now, the general estimate is that our universe is 10 to the 27th power meters across. Once again, somebody measured. And the general estimate is that the smallest thing in our universe is a subatomic particle 10 to the negative 26th power. Now, if you were to take an average of all human beings' heights, if you were to look on planet Earth, what's the average height of all human beings? And so you were to take um, babies, toddlers, preschool kids, hobbits, adults, you would end up average height of all human beings somewhere around one meter, making human beings the middle in size in the universe. And, and you, you're fascinating. How many of you can see me? Excellent. Encouraging, to say the least. <laughs> yeah, you have this visual cortex in, in your brain connected ultimately to the retina in your eye. 110 million cones, 7 million rods, over a million nerve fibers, all working in harmony so that you can see things. You have over several hundred billion brain cells, neural connections somewhere in the trillions. Every second your brain doing roughly a trillion computations and no one of those brain cells are the same. In any given one or two second period, your body has just produced two to 10 million brand new red blood cells. You have 100 million white blood cells being stored right now in your bone marrow alone, which raises the question, if your body is producing new red cells and white cells to make you, you, and producing these cells at the rate of hundreds of millions every couple of seconds, how does your body know to make more and more and more of you and, and not somebody else? Every single one of those cells, hundreds and hundreds of millions of cells, has roughly six feet of DNA coiled inside of it. It's like a map, it's a code that tells your body who you are and how to make more of you. If those DNA strands were stretched out into their six foot length and then all of them in your body were put end to end, it would be 80 billion miles of instruction. It would go from the earth to the sun and back 400 times. Your body down to the hundredth billionth millionth of a cell is hardwired to be you and no one else. But those cells are actually made up of a smaller component called an atom. Now, if you wanted to see an atom with your naked eye, you would need to be one billionth of an inch tall. And you'd have an incredibly high voice. <laughs> the Earth is to an orange as an orange is to an atom. If we were to count the number of atoms in one drop of water, if we were to count the number of atoms in one drop of water, it would take every single person on planet Earth counting one drop, one atom every second for the next 20,000 years. Atoms are small. Thank you. It's been great. Now, if you were to take apart an atom, if you had those kinds of tools in your garage, you would discover that an atom in the center is made up of neutrons and protons, and then you would discover that circling around the center very, very quickly are what's called electrons. Now, the question is, what do you mean by circling? An electron orbits an atom several billion times every second or so. They're quite busy. Now, if you have two bonded atoms with all of these electrons orbiting around their centers, in any given second between the two bonded atoms, there would be roughly three billion collisions. Here's what this means. Take a picture of an atom. Take a picture of the same atom a second later. And while that atom will be, in its basic essence, the same atom, it will have changed drastically in that passing second. Take a picture of an atom. Take a picture of an atom a second later. You don't know exactly what it's going to do. 
Now, in the 1890s, a group of scientists, led by a man named J.J. Thompson, said, what if we could take apart an atom? What if we could split an atom? What if we could come up with a thing that makes atoms? Well, if we could split an atom down to the thing that makes up an atom, well, what if we could split it enough to get down to the basic building block of matter? Well, if we could do that, if we could get down to the thing that makes the things, that makes the things, that makes the things, that makes everything, well, then we could explain why everything is how everything is. So they began splitting an atom. They quickly discovered that an atom can be split into a smaller substance called a quark. Atoms are made up of quarks. But then they discovered you can split a quark. And then they discovered the thing that you can split an, a quark into, uh, you can split that. And then they discovered that thing that you can split the thing that you can split a thing to make a quark, uh, they can split that. So, so, so the, the quest kind of went whoop, a little bit off track. And to this day, they're saying they roughly, they, they agree that they've identified at least 100 subatomic particles. You got your mosons, mosons, gluons, nuons, leptons, mesons, endless lists of these unbelievably small things. If you've ever heard the term quantum physics, quanta simply means packets of energy. Because at its core, these atoms and these quarks are simply these bundles of energy. Now, when you get into the subatomic realm, things get very, very strange. They have discovered that a quark can be in one place, can disappear, and appear in another place without traveling the distance in between. <laughs> they have discovered that a quark is capable of what's called simultaneous duality. They have observed quarks, one quark, one quark that is capable of being in two different places at the same time. In 1949, a scientist came up with what's called Bell's Theorem, a personal favorite of mine. Bell's theorem was essentially this discovery. You can take a quark, an atom, and split it in half, and put one half in New York, and you can put the other half in San Francisco. If you take the half, the quark in New York, and you reverse the spin of its electrons, at that exact moment, the half in San Francisco its electrons will reverse their spin as well. If you've heard of the butterfly effect, that's essentially a popularizing of Bell's theorem. In New York State, in 1997, they discovered an exotic meson, and, and we all know how exotic mesons can be. <laughs> this meson appeared for a trillionth of a trillionth of a second, and then it was gone. They don't really know where it came from, and they don't really know where it went. And so you have these unbelievably brilliant subatomic quantum particle physicists saying things like, uh, I don't know. <laughs> they have discovered a subatomic particle called a lepton. And uh, the general consensus is that leptons do exist as individual subatomic particles. The, the only hitch is they've only been able to observe leptons in communities of two and three. And so they say, yes, yes, we understand that this is a single lepton. The problem is we, we only find them existing in groups of two and th three oneness. And, and so the Newtonian understanding of cause and effect has simply taken a beating with quantum physics because you take a picture of an atom, you take a picture of the same atom a second later, they don't know what it's going to do. Well, the assumption was always there's an element of predictability at the very bedrock foundational part of the universe, but the problem is 
quantum physicists are just saying, well, when you get right down to the smallest thing that makes the thing that makes the thing that makes the thing, it, it, essentially the universe at its core is, is unpredictable. The best we can come up with is that the universe at its core is some sort of relationship of energy. So you have brilliant, studied, respected research scientists saying, all we can come up with as the universe at its core is made up of some sort of relational energy that we simply can't control. Some of them are even starting to use words like personality. And, and that this energy that holds everything together, that brought everything into existence and somehow sustains or holds everything in existence, gives life to everything, and simply has a mind of its own. We cannot conquer it or put it in a box. It is simply above and beyond what we can comprehend. High-end particle quantum subatomic physicists are starting to sound a lot like ancient Near Eastern Jewish poets. Now, for years there's been a, a disparity because you have those trying to explain the weirdness of the bigness of the universe, my technical scientific language, the weirdness of the bigness, and, and then you have others at the quantum level talking about the weirdness of the smallness. But these two ways of explaining why things get so strange when they go big and why things are so inexplainable when they go small have essentially been two different ways, and so there's been a search for years for what's called a unified theory. Is there some way to explain why the universe, whether you go incredibly far out or incredibly far in, is just strange and unpredictable and it bends and light does all sorts of things? Is there some way to explain it all, and a, and a group has come along who have said, well, the way to explain it is that the ultimate building block of reality is actually small strings. These are called string theorists, and they've presented to the world essentially what's called string theory. So you immediately say, well, wait, wait, well, what do you mean by small? They're essentially saying the universe is to the earth as the earth is to an atom. The universe is bigger than the earth in the same way the earth is bigger than an atom, in the same way an atom is bigger than one of these strings. <laughs> yeah. And they're saying, well, the real issue isn't the bigness and the outness or the smallness and the inness. The real issue is multiple dimensions of reality. Now, uh, to get our minds around dimensions. This is a rectangle, and this is a circle. Now, this circle will never be a rectangle, and this rectangle will never be a circle. This board that I'm writing on is a two-dimensional surface. It has height, and it has width. And so in two dimensions, this rectangle will never be a circle. This circle will never be a rectangle. If you ask me which is which, it's either or. It's either a circle or a rectangle. Now let's move from two dimensions to three dimensions. Let's add a dimension. This marker from the side is a rectangle. And yet, if you look at it from the end, it's a circle. So in two dimensions, it's either a rectangle or a circle. You add a dimension, and all of the sudden, what was either or mutually exclusive becomes both and. If the question was, well, is it a rectangle or a circle in three dimensions, uh, yep. <laughs> How much blood has been spilled and oxygen wasted arguing over whether it's this or this, when maybe sometimes the answer is, yep. Think about religion alone. Faith or science? Yep. Or, or think, or, uh, like, oh yeah, okay. Predestination or free will. Arr. And the one side has a list of Bible verses, <laughs> kung fu, and the other side has their list of Bible verses, and maybe the good God who made everything is like, look it, I gave you the marker trick, yep. And you have the circle group, which is like, come on, man, join the circles. The universal loving embrace, come on. And you have the rectangles, Wait, we have right angles. We are four times more right than you are. But you, but you, but you you're dead, dude, 
we're dangerously close to becoming a square. Yes, what we need are more straight lines, not all this, uh, what we need are straight lines. But dude, you can't smoke a rectangle. <laughs> Maybe sometimes the good God who made everything just says, yep. Now, in the 1800s, a British headmaster named Edwin Abbott proposed a land of people who were trapped in two dimensions. What if there was a land of people who did not have three dimensions as you and I have, and they were trapped in two dimensions? He called this land Flatland. What could we learn as enlightened 3 Ders if we were to spend time observing those trapped in two dimensions? How, if you lived in two dimensions, would you experience something that had three dimensions? What if you were trapped in flatland and all you had was height and width? And what if you encountered a three-dimensional object? What if my ring passed through your two-dimensional world? What if a three-dimensional ring passed through this flat two-dimensional world? If this ring was able to pass through this marker board, how would they See it. <laughs> Imagine when it first touched, it would be a point. Then as it continued to go through, the point would turn into a line, and then it would turn into two lines, and then when the ring was halfway through, it would appear as two different lines, and then if it kept going, the lines would come back together, point, and then it would be gone, correct? Because you talk about this all the time <laughs> <laughs> with your friends. You're out at a restaurant. You know, I was thinking the other day, napkin, ring, I don't know. <laughs> Now, how would these two process what they just experienced? How would the two of them, if that happened? Uh, did you see that? <laughs> a little weird, wasn't it? What was that? I don't know, I don't know. Well, well, what did you see? Well, I saw a point, and it turned into a line, and it turned into two lines, and then the lines got farther and farther apart, then they came back together, one line, point, and then it was gone. I know. I actually, I think it was something more. Well, what do you mean? I, I think it might have been a ring. What do you mean? It almost has to me a certain Monty Python. A ring? <laughs> uh, I do say. <laughs> a ring? Yeah, I, I, I think that the point, line, 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 point, I think that was actually, that was actually something more. Well, have you ever seen a ring? No. Ever seen a picture of a ring? No. Ever held a ring? No. Ever, never been to Ringville? No, you haven't. So, uh, no, you know what all it was? Point, line, 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 line. That's all I need to know. Line, 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 point, gone. That's all it was. I don't know. I, I just, um, do you have any evidence? No. Do you have any proof? No. Any photos? No. Anything in a lab you can test? No. So this person ends up having to use words like, I don't know, I just sense, feel, trust, believe, have faith. And so the experience of the ring actually reveals two vastly divergent worldviews. The one person immediately shifts into flatland is all we have. It's all we can prove. It's all we know. It's all we can document. And so it's all we have the empirical evidence for. The one person essentially becomes what's called reductionistic. All it was was point, line, 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 point, gone. And they can argue very persuasively because this person can't come up with any tangible evidence. And so their worldview is essentially, it's all it is, there's nothing more, don't be all weird. And this person is left in the awkward position of maybe being definitively convinced that there, that was a ring, and yet all they can do is talk about nudges and hints and senses and feelings and beliefs and maybe even have to use words like faith. Now, what if me, Rob, in all of my 3D-ness, what if I decided to mess with them and I came and just kept my hand like right here? <laughs> and, and what if the one said, uh, you, you feeling anything weird? No. I don't know, man. I think Rob is near. <laughs> I just feel the overwhelming presence of Rob. And the one could be saying, what are you talking? I could have my hand this close, and the one would be saying, what are you talking about? You're out of your mind. You're talking nonsense. You have to give up all that superstitious 
mythic stuff. And the other one was saying, no, 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 I think Rob is very close. Or what if I really wanted to mess with them and I just jammed my hand right through their world? <laughs> well, my fingers are of different length and of different thickness. So my fingers would appear at slightly different times and they would be of slightly, they would produce circles and those circles would be of slightly different circumferences and diameters. So the one could say, did you see that? Yeah. I, I think all those five circles, you know, I, I think they're all related. What? They came at different times? They're different sizes? No, 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 I think, I think, uh, I think it was the hand of Ra. <laughs> and once again, the person with the reductionist viewpoint is they came at different times, they're of different sizes, you have to give up this mythic superstitious nonsense. All you have is a couple rings, circles that don't have any relation to each other. And the other one sounds like they've completely lost their mind, but in fact, they are dead on right. See, their experiences of three-dimensional objects would expose vastly different worldviews, and the one who sounded crazy would actually be dead right, and the one who sounded extremely rational, calculating, and weighed all the evidence would be missing a whole new reality right here within this one. Now, in Flatland, you also run a risk because there are boundaries in Flatland. There are those who say, this is simply how it is. There is no other world. There is no higher law. There is no greater purpose. We have flat land. That's all we have. And there would be others who would keep insisting there's more, there's beyond, there's something else, and you would have great conflict. The story of human history is the story of enlightened souls again and again who simply insisted this isn't all there is, and others who had great power invested in maintaining this is all there is, ultimately have harmed lots and lots. If you were to sort through the crucifixion of Jesus Christ, what is it? The world was ruled by an empire that simply said this is how it works. The Roman emperor is God, bow down to the emperor, the empire is all powerful, and an obscure Jewish rabbi comes along and preaches the kingdom of God. What is the essential conflict within the story of Jesus? Somebody who simply looks at the power brokers of Flatland and says, there's more. There's more more. Now, you and I are trapped in time. We cannot go to the right in time. We cannot go to the left in time. We cannot go up in time or down in time. You and I are trapped in what's called linear forward time. We can only go forward. We cannot go back in time. And so, you're born, you pay taxes, you watch your country's World Cup team lose, you die. Now, <laughs> You and I cannot go, we can only go forward in time, left, right, up, down, forward. We cannot go back in time. Time is one dimension, and, and yet we can't go back, and so essentially, we lose the back time. You and I are trapped in a half dimension of time. Time for us only goes forward in one direction. Now, what if there was a being who wasn't trapped in one dimension of time? What if there was a being who had a two-dimensional awareness of time? What if there was a being who had a three-dimensional awareness of time? Well, you and I have a three-dimensional awareness of space, so what if there was a being who had an awareness of space and time the way that you and I are aware of space? What if there was a being who looked at this marker? Let's have this marker represent your life and my life. Born, pay taxes, <laughs> die. Now here's your life, here's my life. What if there was a being who had a three-dimensional awareness time. Could they, in looking at our life, do this? Could they do this? Could they do this? Would they say, oh, I have no idea what she's going to do next? <laughs> no, they'd probably just say, yep. <laughs> they wouldn't be confined in any of the ways you and I are being confined with. They might even use phrases like, in the beginning, you know, before time, to which those trapped in a half dimension would be like, ah, that's not helping. <laughs> At the time of this poem, 
Genesis emerged among a group of people who lived in a culture in which people assumed that the gods and goddesses are trapped in time just like humans are. So the gods and goddesses are born, uh, they start to get ill, so you build them a giant pyramid, stuff all their stuff into the pyramid, they die, and then their son or daughter comes along and rules, and then the next ruler. And so their understanding was that the gods and goddesses are trapped in a half dimension of time just like we are. It's at this time that God appears to a shepherd named Moses and says, Moses, I want you to liberate my people because God is in the liberation business. And uh, God says to this uh, shepherd, Moses, Moses, I want you to set my people free. And Moses is a very practical man and says, okay, but I'm going to need a name. Can you tell him what your name is? And God says to this man, Moses, well, just tell them my name. Just tell them I am. To which Moses responds, because that pretty much clears it up. <laughs> yeah. Nothing fuzzy there. Now, uh, wherever you have 10 rabbis, you have 20 opinions on about what the name means. Some say the name means I always have been, I am, I always will be. Others say way too cumbersome. The name is essentially raw essence. I just am pure existence. Some say the name is a way of saying, God saying, I am not trapped in time like all the gods and goddesses that you know of. I stand outside of it simply am, existence in its most pure, primal form. The astounding dimension to this story is this God who is outside of time, this God who is spirit. It was assumed that all the gods and goddesses had shape and form. You had statues, carvings, totems, so that you could get your mind around the God. The God or goddess always at the time this poem emerged, had a shape or a form. This God is spirit. This God even says, or, or Moses says to the people, remember when you encountered this God, this God had no shape or form. This God again and again is a God who transcends time and transcends space. This God is spirit, cannot be contained with physicality. There is no shape or form. So, so this God, these are brand new ideas in human history. No one had ever suggested anything like a God who isn't trapped in time, a God who can't be confined in physical space. In, in the history of ideas or the evolution of religion, no one had ever even begun to talk about a God like this. The astounding thing about this creation poem is not only is this God outside of time and outside of space, but this God chooses to act within human history. This God chooses to act in tangible ways, and that act is to create this God who is endless, infinite, beyond, who has no boundaries, edges, thingness, shape, or form, chooses to act very specifically in human history by creating, and then in Genesis Two, another account of creation, this God breathes into dust and makes people. Now, at the other end of the spectrum, there is this realm of the spirit with no shape, form, no physicality. There is this realm in Genesis 1 of physicality, light, dark, sky, water, land, sea, and then out of the land comes trees, and the trees produce fruit and the fruit has seeds. So in Genesis 1, there is a dimension of this God as spirit. This God has no physicality. And then at the same time, there is this physical universe that's being brought into existence. And each thing in the poem is more complicated than the thing before it. Light and dark. Well, sky and water, you can actually... You can actually hold water, land and sea, dirt. You can actually hold dirt. So each thing, tree, is more complicated and advanced, more detail, more precise than rocks. And then fruit is more complicated, more design than trees, but then the seeds can fall on the ground and produce another tree. Maybe this would help. Frisbee? iPod. <laughs> now, <laughs> somebody going... Ah, yeah. <laughs> so in this poem, each thing that's being created is slightly more advanced and complex than the thing after it. It's going somewhere, more arrangement, more design, more creativity. And so you have this 
uh, seed. And a seed is significant because a tree can produce fruit, and then the seed is its ability to reproduce. After seeds, then you have animals. Then God creates a man, each thing more advanced than the thing before it. God creates the man, steps back, and says, I think I can make something slightly more advanced. Any girl power in the room whatsoever? <laughs> and so she shall be called woman, because when the man first saw her, he said, whoa, man. God said, it is not good for the man to be alone. He won't know what to wear. Actually, this is fascinating. In Genesis 2, the... Creation of the woman comes right after the naming of the animals, which is like, well, what's the point? Well, the man is told to name the animals, and nothing is a corresponding strength. And so then God makes this woman as a corresponding strength. Now, if there's a day, if there's a scene that would have been brilliant, how about the naming of the animals? Would that have been brilliant? I picture God, the God character. Adam. Hey, Adam. Or maybe just, hey, because there's no one else there. Okay, here's the deal. Here's, here's the deal. We're going to bring these animals in. We're going to bring them in one by one. We'll bring them in two by two later. And uh, we're going to bring them in, and you just name them whatever you want to name them. So you picture Adam like, okay. So they bring, uh, hippopotamus. <laughs> picture God like, yeah, okay, hippopotamus. <laughs> there's, a, there's a database angel. Uh, how do you want me to spell that? Any way you want. So they bring in the next one. Adam's like starting to kind of get his groove on. Okay, I can do this. Uh... Duckbill platypus. <laughs> God, God is like, seriously, wow, angels over here. Like, seriously, where did you get this guy? I can't you know, I could start over. Uh, I had something stuck on my sandal, and I took it, and I <laughs> blew it off. But, but God wants to be encouraging. Seriously, Adam, you're the man. No, Seriously, you are. You're the man. <laughs> so, so, but like a couple days into it, or a couple day, day into it, Adam is just whipped. Oh, he's thought every possible. He's so tired. Not one creative idea left. One more. One more. Okay. Can you do one more? Yes, I can do one more. Uh, dog. God's like, dog, yeah, hey, wait, that's my name backwards. What? <laughs> oh, one more, really? Yeah, one more. Whoa, okay. Uh, I don't know, cat. Cat. And, hey, wait, I didn't make those. Uh, <laughs> That's funny, I don't care who you are. <laughs> so, anyway, ah, uh, yeah. Now, uh, this poem is proposing things that no one had ever proposed. It's a brand new idea in human history. See, everything in the creation story fits into one of two categories. It's either purely physical, rocks, dirt, trees, seeds, it's either water, it's either purely physical, or it's, it's uh, spiritual, it's spirit, it's I am, it's action. It's either immaterial or material, it's either physical or non-physical. Everything in creation is either one or the other. A tree has physicality but no spirit. I am a spirit with no physicality. Fruit, physical, no spirit. Spirit, spirit, but no physical. Everything is one or 
the other. Angels, spirit, no physicality. Sky, water, physicality, no spirit. And then, in this creation story, the human being is physical, dust, and yet is breathed into by spirit. There is nothing in the entire created realm that is totally spiritual and totally physical. Is a human being spiritual or physical? The answer, of course, yep. Now, this has profound implications for how you and I understand what it means to be human. You are here. Maybe you've heard somebody say, well, I'm just not into spiritual things. Are you, are you a human being? Yeah, too late. <laughs> the issue is not whether you're a spiritual being or you have a spirituality. The issue is whether your eyes are open and you're aware of it. You cannot deny what is central to your makeup as a human being. In the Hebrew language, there is no word for spiritual. If you would have said to Jesus, Jesus, how is your spiritual life? What? What do you mean? Because to label one area spiritual is to label other areas not spiritual. It's absolutely foreign to the world of the scriptures. It's absolutely foreign to the worldview of Jesus. The assumption is that you are a fusion of two realms, and a human being occupies a totally unique place in the entire universe. How you handle your money, how you handle relationships, sexuality, forgiveness, reconciliation, business, school, work, play, recreation, everything we do, we do as an integrated being, 100% physical, 100% spiritual. These first Christians latched onto this right away. Whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it in the name of Jesus Christ. What were they saying? Every act is a spiritual act. It's whether or not you're aware of the implications of what you're doing. Now, this has profound implications for how we understand what it means to be part of a church because it's possible for religious institutions and for churches to actually work against an integrated, holistic spirituality. What can ever so subtly happen is that we emphasize certain things and in the process de-emphasize other things. What can happen ever so subtly is people begin to see God as dwelling in a certain place. Sometimes it's only with a certain person or a certain group of people. Sometimes it's a building. Sometimes it's an hour on a particular day of the week. And whatever so subtly happens is it creeps in that God is there. And obviously something powerful happens when pe people gather for the purpose of worshiping and pursuing this one true God. But ever so subtly what can happen is God is there, and if God is there, ever so subtly God can seem less and less here. But you and I are a fusion of these two realms. We are both. And so perhaps maybe a more biblical way to understand what a community or a church is, is it's a group of people who are bonded together in their pursuit of God. Obviously, they're learning to see God in each other, and God is powerfully present in their midst, but these are people who are being given eyes to see the divine everywhere they go. What is Jesus saying to his first followers Whatever you do for the least of these, you've done for me. What is he trying to teach them? He's trying to teach them to live in such a way that every single interaction they have, they will be fully aware of the God who is present in that interaction. He's teaching them that all of life is drenched in the divine. The issue is whether our eyes are open enough to see it. Now, this creation poem that begins the scriptures has God creating and then God resting. And there's a fascinating thing that happens in the middle of the poem. Sometimes Hebrew poets would work in what's called a chiastic form, which means that they would hide or they would plant the meaning of the poem somewhere in the middle. 
Well, if we were to look at the middle, there are seven days, and so the fourth day is the middle day. In the fourth day, we're told that there are sun, moon, and stars, which is, well, what does that have to do with the meaning of the poem? The explanation for the sun, moon, and stars is God made the sun, moon, and stars in order to mark the days, the years, and the seasons. Now, seasons is an absolutely giant word in the Bible. It's central to the life of somebody who follows God. It was central to the world of Jesus. So anybody reading this poem, that word seasons planted right in the middle would have jumped out to them, particularly because the poem begins with God creating and ends with God resting. Why is seasons significant? Seasons is a reference to two things. First, seasons is a reference to the Sabbath. Who is one of the original audiences of this poem? A group of Hebrews who had been slaves in Egypt. Now, what was life like in Egypt? In Egypt, they worked seven days a week making bricks. They had quotas of bricks they had to meet. Bricks, 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 bricks. Every day, all day, bricks. In Egypt, your worth and value came from meeting your quota of bricks. You were as worth as much as you produced. This was life in Egypt. God rescues these people from life in Egypt, and now he's trying to teach these people what it means to be a human being, not a human doing. God is trying to teach these people what it means to be human. You are not a machine, and in Egypt, their worth came from what they produced, and God is trying to teach these people, your worth does not come from what you produce. Your value does not come from bricks. Your value comes because you are rescued and redeemed children of the one true God. So what does God say? Every seven days, work six days, but then take a day and do no work. Rest, reflect, play, whatever feeds your soul. Take one day a week to remind yourself that you are not a machine. So, so, so the seasons, first and foremost, is a reference to the Sabbath, the need for a rhythm of creating and resting. Secondly, that wasn't enough. In the scriptures, it's not just every six days, then take a day and Sabbath, rest, play, sing, dance, whatever feeds your soul. But there were seven major feasts throughout the year where God said, play, you will have fun. And so seven times a year, there were these giant feasts. The Feast of Sukkot in the fall, literally an eight-day celebration, singing, dancing, adult beverages, whatever, <laughs> giant. The seasons, the Sabbath and the seven feasts were essentially God's way of saying, somebody get me a DJ. <laughs> now, there was, in the culture at this time, <clears throat> there were several other creation stories. The central creation story that was popular among the masses when this Genesis poem emerged, essentially taught that the world came about because of conflict. It, it still survived. You can go to a library and read up on it. Essentially, the belief was that the world came about because this God was, was mad with this God, and this God was jealous with this God, kind of like big-time wrestling meets soap operas in the sky. And there was a smack down here, and there was a love triangle here. And out of this conflict came the earth. So the essential belief among most people at the time of Genesis 1 is that the earth came about because this God was upset with this God, and out of their prime evil conflict and battle, we got the world we know. This poem charges onto the scene and it's similar in many ways to those poems. It speaks of land and seas and dirt and creating and shaping and forming and clay. It speaks of many of the same elements, and yet it makes vastly different claims. This poem arising out of the same culture says, no, no, no. We are not here because of divine conflict. We are here because this one true God who exists in some sort of loving, endlessly giving generous community, this one God is so filled with joy and beauty and creativity, it's as if this God can't help but create. I mean, this God starts creating things, and then, and then this God compliments himself, like, man, that's good. This God loves to make things so much, this God just makes things and makes things and makes things and just loves to make things. This God makes things and then says to them, okay, now you make more, and you make more. This God loves to make things that can make 
things. This God makes people in this God's image and says to them, now you take care of it and share in my joy. This poem was absolutely radical in human history because it said, we're not here because of conflict. We're here because of joy. We're the result of divine creativity that said, I can't help but give and spread what I have to more. And so planted right in the beginning of this poem is this word seasons. God creates, God rests, and right in the middle is seasons. So you do the same. Create, but then take time to enjoy what you've created. A couple years ago, I noticed uh, this disturbing habit that my boys had developed when they would say my name. And, and they were quite young at the time. They would say, Dad, Dad, Dad. I was like, what, do they have a stutter? What, what's the problem here? And I would notice, Dad, Dad, Dad. And, and it began to bother me. And then one day, uh, we were playing. I think it was Legos or something. We're down on the floor. And uh, I heard the Dad, Dad, Dad. And I, and I noticed it at about the second Dad and was fully there by about the third Dad. And I realized at that moment that I had been there playing with them. And yet, I had been um, somewhere else thinking about a meeting thinking about things I have to do, thinking about emails, thinking about phone calls to make when I was done with them, and I realized that I was there with them, but I was actually somewhere else. And I realized that my boys had gotten used to their dad being here, but actually being somewhere else. And so over time, they had just realized it takes about three tries to get dad here. In uh, Exodus chapter 24, God says to Moses, Moses, uh, come up on the mountain and stay here. And, and the rabbis point out that the literal translation, that, that the, the word to stay is the word hayah, that means to be. So the ver verse literally, the command literally reads, Moses, come up on the mountain, and then when you get on top of the mountain, be on top of the mountain, which is kind of like something from the school of redundancy school. Um, <laughs> I get it. If I'm on top of the mountain, I'm on top of the mountain. That's where I am. And the rabbis say, oh, no, 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 no. This command is brilliant. They say, God understands human nature. God understands that Moses will spend all sorts of energy getting up to the top of the mountain. And when he gets to the top of the mountain, he'll immediately begin thinking and planning how he's going to get down, and in the process, he won't ever be fully present on top of the mountain, and he'll miss it. Why does this creation poem have this refrain, evening, morning, evening, morning? A Jewish Sabbath begins sundown Friday night. It goes through the night. And then it goes into Saturday and ends sundown Saturday. So a day goes from night to day, from dark to light. And I say this is because a day is a physical picture of the journey ha God has all of us on, moving from dark to light, moving from ignorance to awareness, moving from error to truth. Does the writer have this refrain in here, evening, morning, evening, morning, evening, morning, which is a way of saying, wake up, come into the light? Is the writer saying this? In the midst of creation, there's so much to do. There's so much to accomplish. There's so much to build, so much to administrate, so many emails to respond, so many phone calls to return, so much to create, so much to manage, so much to order. There's so much to do. Be careful that in your managing, creating, ordering, be careful that in the midst of creation, you don't become so consumed in your work that you end up creating all the time and you don't spend any time resting and in the process you lose something and to that first audience perhaps you find yourself back in another sort of Egypt.
is the writer saying, don't become a machine who's so caught up in everything you're doing that you miss the joy, the wonder, the awe of being a human in the midst of this whole world God has made. I have learned that what you look for, you will find. If you want to be a cynic, there's plenty to be cynical about. If you want to be a skeptic, there's plenty to be skeptical about. If you want to be a pessimist, there's plenty to be pessimistic about. What you look for, you will find. But in Psalm 14, it says, a fool says in their heart, there is no God. Now, this is fascinating because you and I would say somebody who rejects the divine, we would say, well, this is somebody who's made an intellectual decision. They've looked at the columns, they've weighed the evidence, and they've said there is no God. But the psalm says, no, somebody who, who rejects God, who says there is no God, this is somebody who's made a decision in their heart. The psalmist says that is not ultimately an intellectual decision, a cognitive ruling that person has made. It's a posture of the heart. You can look at this big mysterious world that God has made. You can look at light and how it does all sorts of strange things. It bends and it distorts. You can look at how the universe is not static, how there are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of these dials that are all perfectly calibrated to let this little blue and green ball produce human life and sustain human life. You can look at the universe in its smallness with all of the quarks. You can look at all of these odd little things that are indeterminate, that have essentially a personality of their own. String theorists are now saying that they believe that they can prove at least 11 dimensions to reality. They're now saying, I heard the other day, they're now saying they think they have a 12th and a 13th, but string theorists are saying there are at least 11 dimensions to reality. We can look at that and say, wow, even scientists are saying there must be more. Nah, it's all probably, they'll just end up with it, or someone like Bill Gates will figure it all out and we'll be all set from there. Uh, and you can look at all of this and say, there's nothing more going on here. Yeah, spirit, breath, that's all just made up by religious people as a crutch to deal with the pain of life. You can look at all of this and say, there's nothing more, there's nothing else going on. It just is a bunch of stuff. Or you can choose to see wonder and beauty and awe. You can see the quarks, and you can see the dimensions, and you can see light, and you can see photons, and you can see the stars, and you can see the dials, and you can choose to say, whoa, wow, unbelievable, amazing. You can choose with the posture of your heart to worship, to be filled with wonder and awe, to believe that not only are we here for a reason, but there is a big story being told, and you and I each get to be a part of it. What you look for, you will find. A friend of mine was in Malawi, West Africa, and there had been a terrible famine there, and the people hadn't eaten, and he had been working with several other agencies to arrange for food to be brought in. So they had this giant celebration when food was brought, and people who hadn't eaten in a while got to eat for the first time. And my friend said, if you want to see a celebration, see people at the end of a famine eat. He said it was unbelievable, singing, dancing, just living in the moment of we can now eat. And he says they set up this, this uh, tent awning out in the middle of this field, and he says partway through the celebration, he says they hear this unbelievably loud uh, like whirling noise, and they step out of the awning, and they look to the side, and there, headed towards the clearing, was a tornado. So he says we all stood and just watched the tornado come towards us, like you do. <laughs> he says the tornado comes to the edge of the clearing, stops, goes around the perimeter of the clearing, and then keeps on going in the direction it was originally headed in. He says they're standing there watching it when one of the locals runs up to them and says, do, do you see the celebration here is so magnificent, even the spirits have come to witness it. What you look for, you will find. And what we are looking for, and what you are looking for, and I'm looking for is right here. It's not over the mountain, and it's not across the sea. What we're looking for is right here. The reality that Jesus came to announce, to die for, and to rise for, he called the kingdom of God. We might say the reality of God or the way of God. This reality, Jesus said, is here. It's now. It's among us. It's upon us. Jesus never taught that it's somewhere else. He said things like, look 
at those flowers. Have you, have you watched the birds in a while? Notice in your conversations with the least of these, you, you might even find God there. He came essentially to articulate for us an integrated, holistic spirituality that everything we are looking for is not over there. It's not behind there. It's not down there. It's right here. The issue is if our eyes are open to see it. May you slow down so that you don't miss a thing. May the eyes of your heart be enlightened. May you be fully present right here, right now. May you come to see that the reality of God is at hand, among us, upon us, near, here. And may you come to see that everything is spiritual. Thanks.